Turn in your Bibles to Luke, if you would, chapter 2. Open your worship guide where I've given a basic introduction to what we're after today. Last week, I think one of the most profound comments I made, if it could be called profound, it was to me, is that uh, the Mary, the sweet young teenage girl, was not only pregnant with the babe of God, she was also pregnant with the mind of God, and that's the heart of it. How you think is everything. And to think about everything like he thinks about everything conquers everything. That's the theme. Remember our little motto I've sought to teach you, yesterday is history, tomorrow is mystery, but today is a gift. That's why we call it the present. Open today, open each day as a gift from God, either buffeting or blessing. Both will come, and we ought to receive them in the power of our living Lord. I gave you an assignment to read these passages over and over, these 14 little insights that Luke gives us. I hope you've done that. I hope maybe you'll do that before Christmas as I have come along and just tried to touch on a few of them as I want to touch today. For the scripture portion, let's look, if we would, in verse 13. Well, let's go back to verse uh, uh, 10. The, angels, uh, had, the angel had appeared to the shepherds in verse 10 of Luke chapter 2. But the angel said unto them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. Mega karas is the word in Greek. We get our word mega bucks, big. Big joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in clothes. And I don't know why they just don't go ahead and say it. These were strips or bandages that they would write, put around little babies. They didn't have diapers like we have today, but literally the modern translation of this, you'll find the baby all prepared and diapered there in the feeding trough. That's really what it meant. He was in a feeding trough. All of you mothers out here, we're looking at uh, a special bed and place for a little baby coming, and we wouldn't think of putting him out in the cold in a feeding trough, but that's where Jesus was laid his first nap after he was born on earth. He was lying in a manger, the common things with God's meaning. Isn't that beautiful? That's what it's all about. Happy are those who do that. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to the men who are pursuing his will. That's what it means in the Greek. Not peace to all men, but peace to those. The presence of God's power. Remember, peace is not the absence of problems. Peace is the presence of power. Power and peace to those who are seeking God's will. And when the angels left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has told us about. My dear friends, the first telling point in the introduction of this sermon. Have you ever noticed it? I never had. I'm embarrassed to tell you. You may want to fire me. I'm not worthy to be your pe preacher. I'm not smart enough. But the first time in my life I noticed this week that the angels didn't tell them to go to Bethlehem. All my life, I have thought that the angels appeared and said, go to Bethlehem. Nowhere in the Greek text is that stated. Did you know that, Pastor Purifoy? Even Pastor Purifoy didn't know that. I cannot believe it. Think of it now. Did you know it? No. The angels didn't tell him to go. The angel just said, unto you is born in Bethlehem today a Savior. And you will recognize him because he's been wrapped, laid in a feeding trough. But he didn't tell them to go. You have to make up your mind yourself to go to what God has already prepared for your life. Isn't that magnificent? And it's today. There are those of you out there pressured, hungry, weak, sick, lonely, anxious, financially uh, under the gun, whatever it may be, maritally in turmoil, children you're concerned about, whatever it is, today, God has prepared a place for you to go. And he'll have a sign there to let you know you're in the right place, that he will be the Savior, he will be the one who will pull you out of whatever hole you are in. If you will make up your mind to go. Well, I ought to give the benediction and quit, shouldn't I? 
how confused we get about the messages of Christ. You remember the little boy, he was raised in a very Pentecostal church. And uh, his dad was a preacher. And so he was about six or seven. He decided he wanted to be a preacher. So he had his little friends around and he was playing with them and he was preaching and then he was baptizing them. And of course, in the Pentecostal church, I baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. And so his mother walked in and found him. He was baptizing all his little friends. I baptize you, name, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the, of the Son and into the hole you go. <laughs> he was putting them down like that. I think most of us get a little confused about what uh, the Lord's messages might be for us. When I was uh, a youngster, uh, God Bless America came out. God Bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. You know it. Well, you know how kids are. And my mother heard me. I was walking around singing it. And I'd always get to that line, God Bless America, land that I love, stand beside her, Henry Guider. She said, who's Henry Guider? I said, he's the guy that stands there. And she said, no, he's not. And uh, I didn't ever knew. Can you, Henry Guider, they still kid me about that. My children do, my wife and my mother. Uh, when will I grow up? How many of us have the wrong impression about the church? I was getting ready one time talking to a young man about being baptized. He was a professional man in his late 20s. He said, I don't feel worthy to be baptized. I said, my son, you've missed the whole point. If you feel worthy, you're unworthy. The way to feel worthy to be baptized is to know you're unworthy. That's what it's all about. We get all confused, don't we? I hear people all the time tell me I need to go to church more. I need to go to church more. I need to go to church more. No, you don't. You need to know God better. That's the point. What are we here for today? Go to church? I hope not. Pity, pity on you. But if we're here to learn something about him, to know God better, that's why we're all together. Oh, the misperceptions. Friend, today will you go. There'll be a sign. There's always been a sign. There's always been a word from God. There's always been a circumstance. There's always been a verse. There's always been a friend that if I got up and went to what God had prepared for me, he would show me that's what it was. Thank you, Dr. Luke, for such a great insight is that. Look at your um, outline here, the birth of Jesus, number eight. You have it. You have your outline and looking at it. The birth of Jesus. <clears throat> if God wants to change a life, what does he do? Send a baby. If God wants to change a world, what does he do? Send a baby. There's going to be a lot of changes around our house this uh, week. Uh, I pray little Hayden Dwight will arrive safely. Pray that he is a boy. That's what all the show the indications are. But things are going to change. Women, let's vote. How many of you ladies here would say that the greatest thing that's ever happened to you is to have a baby? Can I see your hands? Come on, that's right. What an amazing change, what it did to you. And you ladies who have not yet had physical children and may never have, you can have spiritual children. That's always the thing about it. Don't sit there and, and feel sorry for yourself. A greater thing even is to have a spiritual child. All of you women can be mothers of Israel if you want, and I pray that you shall. If you want to change a life, send a baby. If you want to change a world, same thing, send a baby. Send a baby, and everything would be different. That's what the Lord Jesus did. And then notice the, uh, if you just see the, how Jesus births things. Uh, in the worship guide today, we've quoted A.W. Tozer, and his quote there said it the way I've never seen it before. In the fullness of time, he humbled himself. You put that with Philippians 2, for even though he were a son, he thought his equality with God was not a thing to be selfishly grasped, but he humbled himself. And out of that one little reading, of the uh, worship guide today, qu seeing Tozer's quote, which I didn't put in, our staff put in, in the fullness of time, he humbled himself. And the Lord said to me, that's it, H. The older you get, the fuller of time you become. The more you humble yourself, the more you become like my son. Thank God for the time and the pressures and the battles that humble us before the Savior. Notice the second, the obedience that uh, satisfies. If we're obedient to God... We can always rejoice. Remember the little old phrase? I know all of you are pressured. Some of us are by money and all the rest. But even though the birds have bills, they still sing. <laughs> it's a cute line, isn't it? Now, why don't you? With all your bills. Your bills shouldn't stop you from singing. But the obedience that satisfies, as I said before, I heard, God bless America. 
I decided I would risk, expose myself to singing God Bless America. And my mother finally had me adjust it to God Bless America. I knew how to sing it right. And so the whole part of the gospel we hear, we expose ourselves to truth, and then we adjust. We hear, expose, adjust. We hear, expose, adjust. The highway to heaven or the highway to success is always under construction. None of us are there yet. None of us will ever be there. The only person in this congregation who got there this week was Bob McClellan. Being confident of this very thing, as Paul told the Philippians, that I will complete that which I have begun in you. What a loss. What a loss. Well, uh, let's look at the necessity. Uh, no, disobedience satisfies. It does. Look at the number 11. The necessity and power of first steps. Look at verse 21 of chapter 2. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, his name was Jesus, the name of the angel. They went to the temple. Now, what can we say about all this? First steps were necessary. And they presented two little turtle doves. You must start somewhere. And I'm challenging you to begin today. That's where they began. You know, when Mary and Joseph offered up the two turtle doves or two pigeons, you know what that was? That was the most inexpensive offering they could get by way. They, they were cheap. Someone standing there looking at them said, well, they gave a cheap offering. Can you believe that? That the parents, the human parents of the Son of God, when they came to the temple, didn't give two huge bullocks, two beautiful clean heifers, even two lambs, they started with the lowest thing. The Son of God had the cheapest offering possible offered for him at his purification at the temple. What does that say to you and me? I don't care how low you are today, start. Some of you here who've already given up. Listen, people never fail, they just quit. There's not a one of you here that needs to fail. But I promise you, you'll fail if you quit. And that's one of the things I've learned, thank God, and I have vowed, Lord, I will never quit. I don't care how much rages against me. Help me continue to follow you. The necessity and the power of first steps. We have to control our appetites. I have a whole sermon coming up in January on appetites. It's what you have an appetite for that'll make you what you are. I won't get into it now, but I'm excited. In fact, uh, last, when was it? This morning I got so excited I outlined all my sermons from the day we move into the sanctuary to the day we dedicate it. Lord, if I was so loaded on this anyway, if I know I studied any more, I'd just be more frustrated. I had more to say than we had, had time to say anyway. Notice the next one, the prayer song of Simeon. Now, Simeon, they met him in the temple, verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was righteous, devout. He was waiting for the comfort or the coming of, uh, of Israel. In verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Can you imagine? I can hardly imagine now what's going to be like first time I hold my sixth grandchild in my arms. You can't put things like that into words, can you? There's only a spirit that tells you or begins to tell you how magnificent that is. And I think of Simeon holding and knowing God. What a voice. The dear old saint. Notice what he said. It's unbelievable. Verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, because God had told him he'd see the Savior before he died. God will fulfill every promise he's made to you. Why don't you find out what they are? The Lord Jesus Christ has more promises he's made to every one of us here, but we are so dense and taken by the world that we're more concerned. We, have, we follow the sport God or the money God or the time God or the Christmas God rather than the God alone who's made promises to us that can be fulfilled. How many promises has he made to you you're ignoring and missing? the abundant life and power to live in strength and love to those you love. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared. Once you see God, it doesn't make any difference whether you live or die. 
That's why the Apostle Paul said, I'd rather depart and be with Christ. Nevertheless, it's necessary for me to main, remain here. And young people don't feel sorry for us older, older folks. The older you get in Christ, the younger you get in understanding. Hey, that's what I'm discovering. The older I get, as I grow in Christ, the younger I get. Because I discover again the freshness and the wonder of all that Jesus Christ is doing. The more excited I get about the carols, the more excited I get about the baby, the more excited I get about children, the more excited I get about truth, the more excited I get about his forgiveness. The more excited, really, I get about just accepting my little old self for what I am and saying, Lord, I'm not much, but I'm all I've got. Hallelujah. Help me. Help me be what you want me to be. <laughs> oh, oh, Savior. Simeon, I see what you're talking about here. I can taste it just a little, just a little. Now, that's the prayer of Simeon. Uh, I've seen your wholeness. That's what he says. See, if you see the wholeness of God, everything's all right. We know the answer. Christ will return in triumph. All we have to do is to take our blows and take our hits and keep following him until he's coming and give an attitude of praise and joy about all things. That's what Christmas says to us. It's worked out just like he has planned. It works then, it works now, it'll work then. Therefore, that ought to make a difference how we think and how we live. Thank you, Simeon. I was talking to... Larry Atterbury, Larry has fought a battle with cancer this year, a wonderful member of our staff and, uh, and our building staff. And I was talking to him last night. I'd heard a report, checked it out. He said, it's all right. But we were talking about Bob McClellan. And he said, you know, Pastor, I saw him about just a month ago, and he told me right out here, he said, I'm trying to get everything kind of together. I'm trying to wind up a lot of things. And Larry said, I asked Bob, I, why do you feel like you're, Getting ready to leave us or anything? And Bob said, oh, nothing like that. The Lord tells you what to do. I said at the funeral yesterday, the last time I saw him out there, I said, brother, I love you. It's been a long time since your heart attack. We need to have lunch. He said, pastor, I love you. There's no one in this church that loves you, supports you more than I do. You hate to leave men, lose men like that, don't you? And I prayed for him, and something in me, I had a premonition. I've got to see him quick. Isn't that interesting? Well, I wasn't quick enough. And we never are. Uh, you never do enough for those you love. Never. That's a sign of real love, see. Gail told me that he had told her that, uh, Gail, honey, sometimes I'm as, as important, I'm as important as the pastor meeting all those people out there. And I, said, I told the folks yesterday at the funeral, no, he's more important than the pastor. I tell you who's important, Pastor Purefoy, it's those choir members that show up and rehearse every week and they're up here trying to have the grace of God on their face singing the, 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 the wonders of our Lord. Those people out there who walk in the parking lot, it's easy today to be in the parking lot. It's nice weather. Last week it was freezing. It's that woman who Sunday after Sunday shows up, takes that little baby for an hour in the nursery. I could go on and on and on about how H.D. McCarty is not the most important person in this church. Thank you, Bob. He's deacon of the week. He's already done his ministry. It's not sometimes you are as important as a pastor. Most of the times, you're more important than the pastor. I can get up here and crank out a sermon and look holy, but it's you living out holiness and sharing the word of God with the people where the rubber hits the road that the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is really seen. Hallelujah. Notice the prophecy of Anna, number 13. She knew, she knew the secret of intimacy with God. <clears throat> Notice uh, in uh, verse 37, she was a widow there until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Now, most of us read that and say, good night, what a religious fanatic. I think uh, the first really major doctrinal thing I might have added to your life new today is the idea that the angel didn't tell him to go to the, to go to the, the manger. I'd never seen it before. Maybe you're way ahead of me, but I'd never seen that before. Boy, it just lifted me. Good night. That means I have to go myself. And Man, I played with that for an hour or two. I really loved it. I've been thinking about that all week. Lord, where are the signs I need to go to? Tell me. Let us go. Well, here's the other one. Poor old Anna. 
Oh, she was in church praying and fasting all the time. What a dull life. No, you know the secret of that? She had intimacy with God. Now, here's what I've written down. She earnestly and deeply wanted to know the person behind all our joys. Who is the person behind every joy that you've ever known on earth? Who is the person that created every fulfillment, every peace, every joy, every laughter, every satisfaction, every delight, every wonder, every beauty, every relationship that has blessed your life? Who did it? The God we have come to know in the face of Jesus Christ. Who wouldn't want to be an advocate? and a ruthless pursuer of knowing the person behind all our joys. <laughs> That's what the church is all about. That's what we're here for. That's why we read the book, the love letter. That's why we serve. Savior, what are you telling us? And I want to appeal to you, if you love Christ's church, boy, what opportunity. Uh, give to the budget, give to our HPOV, our building fund, uh, uh, give to missions, our Lottie Moon, hardly said anything about it. Man, the whole world is alive. I spent an hour yesterday reading about the mission, master, passion that's going all over the world. The world is waking up to the cause of Jesus Christ. Millions are coming to Christ. And I said, Lord, I've hardly said anything about it. Well, there's so much to say about him, isn't there? Uh, our little ventures for Christ uh, ministry. Boy, we need help there. The second mile, we need help there. And some of your favorite things. Make a list. Father, how can I go to the place you want me to go? Maybe going to the place is making a financial offering and then seeing what God's going to do. I had a man this week tell me it's a miracle what God has done. I've never had anything like this happen before because he took a step of faith. Thank you, Anna. I want to know the person behind all my joys, the Redeemer, the one who makes things right. Look at number 14. The work and the weight of faith. Now, what were they to do? Look at verse 39. And then Joseph and Mary had done everything required. They did everything they were supposed to do by the law of the Lord. And they returned to Galilee, the town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom and grace of God was upon him. Same thing is said over in chapter 1, verse 80 of John the Baptist. You compare both of those. Both of them grew. Both of them grew strong. It says John the Baptist was in the desert. Jesus had wisdom. Put those two together, and wisdom is having time alone with God. And that John the Baptist was there until he was made public for his preaching, and Jesus Christ said the grace of God was on him. The grace of God always makes you public with his gospel. That's what it's all about. In fact, the word grace, God's riches at Christ's expense is what they told me when I was young. But you know what grace is? It's God's initiative on your behalf. My dear friend and brother and sister and little boy and little girl in this church, there is not a single one of you, not a single one of us here today that the Lord Christ does not have so many initiatives ready for you. Every one of you, oldest to the youngest. You feel you may be the most foolish or the fo most sinful. It doesn't make any difference. Almost would come out, Brian, excuse me, for shaking you and, then, and shaking you. Do we have that down? That Jesus Christ, that's the message, that the Lord Christ has initiatives for every single one of us in this room this morning today to take us where we need to be, that the hand of His grace can fall upon us and make us the men we need to be and the wives we need to be and the mothers and fathers we need to be and the boys and girls we need to be, the people we need to be. And all the baby in the manger says, look what happened to me, Jesus said, because I was obedient to the Father's initiative. What will happen to you if you are obedient to God's initiatives on your behalf? Oh, obey God. That solves it all. Obey God. Lord, I'm not much. I don't know much, but I want to start right where I am. Mary and Joseph gave two pigeons. I give my little old self to you. What's my next step? When Kevin was about five, he would always come into my office. And he loved my typewriter. All kids love those. You know, now it's computers. And he typed one day, he wanted to type me a message. And he typed it. Obey God. O-B-A-Y. <laughs> Kevin. 
And I've had it on my, under my desk, on that little under the glass, for 25 years. And that solves it. And it'll work the details. You say, I don't know all the details, obey God, then you'll know the details. But I know all the answers, obey God, and you'll know all the answers you need to know. That's what Dr. Luke is trying to tell us. Well, there are 14 little gifts here from Dr. Luke. I pray you have opened them all, that you love all of them. I think I'll close with this. You know, I never finish. I just quit. Oh, this is wonderful. I just want to stop. Father, thank you for how wonderful you are. And forgive me when I fail not to make you wonderful to them. See? That's my little job when I preach. And you daddies out there and you men, you ought to ask God's forgiveness if you, don't want to, if you don't make the Lord Jesus wonderful to your wife and to your children. Father, forgive me. What do we do now? Well, I think this is it. What did Mary do? There she was. She held in her arms the little baby who would change the world change the history of civilization and mark eternity. And she said, Father, what do I do? And the Lord told her, go home, Mary, feed him and diaper him, and I'll take care of the rest. 